Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Hopefully you enjoyed the pizza, and it's really great to see you here. Um, let me put on my reading glasses so I can read my notes. Bear with me. Uh, oh, first of all, before I, uh, for those of you that are new here, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, for those of you that have been to these before, thanks. For those of you that it's mandatory for you to be here, well, you know, <laughs> that's what you get for coming here. Um, yes, holding you hostage, as always. <laughs> Um, so just to let you know, we do these or try to do these once a month. Uh, we'll be having another one in uh, October. Uh, Tony Barnes, who has worked on a wide variety of games for many years. Um, we also do a, another event called the Make and Mingle. How many of you have been to our Make and Mingle? Raise your hand. All right, so a fair amount of you. This is an event that is open to anybody in the game uh, uh, industry to, or anybody who's just even interested in games and meeting people. We open up NIFA, we serve some pizza, we have free Wi-Fi. You bring your laptop, you work on your games, and you have a good time. So hopefully I'll see all of you at our next Make, make and Mingle, which will be in probably near the middle end of October, uh, probably around the 15th-ish or so. Keep an eye on our Meetup page or Facebook page or the NIFA webpage. You'll, all the information will be there. Uh, so for tonight, uh, tonight's guest is a veteran game designer. Correct me whenever I'm wrong about something. Uh, so, far, so far, you're good. All right. Uh, who has worked for Sony? Disney, THQ, and many other companies on a wide variety of games for console, computer, mobile, and toys. When he's not designing digital games, you can find him inventing role-playing games, board games, and even LARPs. He is uh, also the person who knows where there is always a game running in Los Angeles. Pretty much. Uh, I am also <laughs> proud to call him my friend. Let's welcome a master of game design, Mr. Andy Ashcraft. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So, uh, as our uh, tradition around here with Masters of Game Design, uh, we always start with a tough question, and that right. is, what is your favorite game? Ooh, my favorite game. Uh, of all time or right now? All time, right now, whichever answer is more interesting. Okay, so, uh, probably the, this is probably gonna take it. Um, my favorite game right now is uh, is a mobile game called Marvel Puzzle Quest. Hmm. So Puzzle Quest is a, is a long-running franchise. Uh, they've added basically Marvel characters to it. Uh, it's got all the collection stuff. I'm a big comic book nerd, so it hits me right in that spot. So right in the nerds. Right in the nerds. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the 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 level up mechanic is is tuned exactly right for for my level of play. The kind of because I like to play about maybe a half an hour a day, um, and as a result, I've probably played this game every day now for. Well, I can tell you, I think it's been about three hundred and fifty days, ah, maybe that's longer, what, maybe. That's why I keep days. getting friend requests from you on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, give you a second here. Uh, I've been playing it literally every day. I think I've missed one day. In the, in the entire time that I've been playing this. Slacker. And, uh, and it is, Just I'm on day, oh, I'm sorry, not 300 and, not 400, 813 days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a lot. <laughs> and I've probably given them uh, close to $200 at this point, uh, which is more than I've ever paid for any other mobile game. Your whale. Yeah. Basically, I mean, but at the same time, I'm a whale over, you know, at this point, almost three years. <laughs> right. right, so you're a very skinny whale. <laughs> I'm very skinny whale. Uh, who's your favorite character in the game? Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, well, it's, it's less about individual characters than it is about uh, the synergy between characters. Right, but you're making like teams of like three, yeah, right? Yeah, you make, you make teams of three, uh, and my current favorite team is Okoye, uh, I have no idea who that is. Uh, she's from Black Panther. Oh, oh, right, right, okay. She's the, I know who she's that is. The, yeah, um, uh, Okoye, Doctor Strange. I know who that is. And Deadpool. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> now, do okay. Now, I, that's I actually remember playing it when it first came out because it was um, was that like a Disney owned company or something, or is that a no. different group? Oh no, it's uh, Josh Austin and and yeah. those guys were there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. D three, D three, D three, D three Geo. My important question about the game is, has, have they added Alpha Flight to it yet? Um, no, they haven't. 
I got to call Josh then. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, up? they're they're missing out. Yeah. They, Those are the best characters ever. Yeah, I was just trying to think. They don't have they don't have Puck. They don't have Aurora. No, no Guardian. North Star. No, no Guardian yet. No Sasquatch. No Sasquatch yet. All right, they're missing out. Yeah, right, yeah. I'll have I think to put in a call in the morning. They're. Uh, they're holding out. They are holding out. Okay. All right. Well, good. Well, maybe I'll answer your friend request finally after 856 <laughs> hours. You, you would enjoy when, the game. When you hit 1,000, then okay. maybe I'll join. I'll let you know. All right. Uh, so um, when did you first get into gaming? Okay. So uh, my first love of games mm. was Dungeons and Dragons. Yay. So uh, some of my, my students, many of my students are here. Uh, uh, they know this. Um, uh, I'm not shy, uh, but so I got to high school. I didn't have very many friends. Uh, did you try being friendly? I did not try being friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it's a it's a skill. It is a skill. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have it, uh, but I did have. I did find some kids playing this weird game in the library, and they let me join. And I can tell you the moment. I can tell you the exact moment that D and D hooked itself into my brain. So we were playing. Uh, 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 oh, what's the what's the name of the module that's super that's super deadly? Tomb of Horrors. Tomb of Horrors. Thank you. Yeah, Tomb of Horrors. We're playing Tomb of Horrors, and they'd given me like this third level ranger character. Oh, you don't go in there with third level. I didn't that's know. That's a that's a minimum six level dungeon. Oh, yes, I didn't know. Uh, or nine. I, I mean, it didn't really matter if you stick your hand in the in the, in the sphere of annihilation. <laughs> sphere of annihilation doesn't really matter what level you are. That's true. Uh, the uh, but uh, so. And there's a page in the module that shows, we walk into this room in the dungeon, and there's a page in the module that you're supposed to show the, the players, and it shows this demon, and he's sort of chained to the wall. There's nothing else in the room except for this little, an urn sitting, why is there an urn? Uh, sitting by the demon. The demon hasn't wrecked the urn. I don't know. Um, we fight the demon, we fight the demon, and we, we, win, we, we defeat the demon. And everybody's like searching for stuff, or searching for stuff, and I say, well, I want to. I want to know what's inside that urn, and the GM was like, "What urn?" I'm like, "On the picture." <laughs> and he looked at the picture, and then he like flipped through the thing, and he was like, "Oh, there's a silver sword in there." In the urn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How and tiny is the silver sword? Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't matter at all. No, that's true. <laughs> it was a big urn. Yeah. Okay. All but right. uh, but that was the moment because I also re I realized. Two things that happened at the exact same moment. I got a reward for doing something that only I thought of. And the GM retconned it in because yeah. it's not in the book. Right, added it in. And he added it in. And right. that was the exact moment that I was like, oh, I get this game. So, this is awesome. So how long from that moment did you then become a dungeon master? Uh, it might have been hours. <laughs> 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 right, because that's the that's like the big mind blowing thing about Dungeons and Dragons is when you not only when you realize it's yeah. malleable enough for you to change it with the situation or using your imagination, but you can really make it anything. Right, right, and yeah, I mean, I uh, you know, I'm, we, I I didn't know anything about it as, at this point, so I, I think this was you know this was in the fall, so by at Christmas I got the Dungeon Master's Guide and a player and a monster manual. Mm -hmm. But no player's handbook. But my friend had a player's handbook, and so I was, I was, I had my own like notebook where I was just literally just copying pages out of the player's handbook right. into this notebook and deciding, making my own edits at the time of like what what's important enough for me to copy into this notebook. I don't need this death saving throw chart, exactly. right? <laughs> Psionics out of here. Yep. Yeah. And I think. Uh, like a D8 and a D20. So I didn't even have a full set of dice. <laughs> full set of, you didn't like go for a six from Clue or something? Or? No, no. I remember, um, uh, yeah, well, I had to, uh, I pulled for the D6 from someplace. Uh, for the other dice, I had uh, chits of paper that I'd written numbers on. You just drew them from a cup. Chits. Yeah, that's how, that's when I remember d and &D. Like I remember the set that came with just chits. Yeah. Where they didn't even have the dice. I think you had to buy the dice separately. And then it came with a crayon, and you had to, like, crayon in the ten, 11 through 20. Please. I well, like the gym dice. I didn't want to mar up my gym <laughs> dice. I still have my crayon dice, actually. <laughs> I think my son uses them now. Um, so uh, so other than D&D, &D, like, what were, like, with video games, what, what video games do you remember playing? Oh, yeah. So uh, we had an Atari 2600. Uh, we had Pong. Mm -hmm. I remember we're old. Uh, 
<laughs> so uh, my dad got us Pong. I remember playing Pong. Uh, the Atari 2600 was probably a year or two after that. Um, one of my favorite games on the Atari 2600 was a game called Dragster. Oh, yeah. And uh, Dragster was cool because each game was literally like, you know, 20 seconds long or less. Like, the faster you can play this game, the better. And it was played with the joystick. It was the, it had a, one of the controllers was a joystick and a button. And that was all it was, was joystick and a button. And uh, this was, joystick forward was the gas. Mm. Button was your clutch. Yeah. And pull back to shift. All right. So... It was all. A, it was a game about breaking your controller. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> and not breaking the dragster because you could blow your engine if you did it. If oh you, right, too if fast you did it or, wrong or yeah. too fast, you and, and you, your time was based on on how well you could like rev up, shift, rev up, shift, yeah, I don't rev think up. I, ever, shift. I don't think I ever played that. Oh, so good. Yeah. So simple and so so exactly pristinely what it was. One of the so it sounds like it was like one of the first real attempts to emulate realistic world, but using kind of the the controller in a, like, I mean, because, you know, the the, the controller is the shorthand, right, of all right. these of all these things that we can do, but this is somebody going, oh, this works this way in the real world, I wanna try and see if it can work yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, very much, a, it was very much a simulation. Yeah. Um, the, the, you, what's, what's on works. the screen was, it was a two player game, uh, or you can play it by yourself, but. It was basically just the top half of the, the screen was one dragster, the side view of one dragster. Top, the bottom half was the side view of the other dragster. And they would, you know, they, they would sort of animate and- The wheels would go. The way and, wheels yeah. would go and you could actually get some, you know, do, pop some wheelies when you were first getting <laughs> off the line. Uh, but that's basically it. It was like extremely simple. Right. It was all about just the, the- The shifting. The shifting. Right, cool, all right. Yeah, so it was very much a simulation, but it was really fun. So from, uh, well, I was going to ask, when did you start designing games? But it sounds like, what did right, you start right. designing for? D&D &D so first? D&D &D 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 was first. Right. Um, uh, dungeon mastering, D&D, &D, coming up with their own dungeons and stuff like that. So when did you realize you could design, like, video games, you know, on a computer or whatever? Like, whatever you, what did you first start when, actually making your own video games on? Um, oh, that's interesting. So, uh I, my family got a TI-99, mm -hmm. so a very early computer. Um, it had 99 bytes, bytes I think, yeah, I think of so. memory on board. Which is like? And you could buy a tape drive to store things on, but we didn't have that. So God forbid you had to save anything. <laughs> right, so I ended up learning how to program in basic on that, uh -huh. and I, had, I, I programmed a little, uh, uh, but the thing is once you program something on it, and once you're done, you turn off the machine, it's gone. So you had to, so, so basically writing out the code in, in, in longhand in a notebook was the way to save it, and then you just type it back in again. Uh, but I had programmed, I had figured out how to, uh, how to take apart the ASCII characters, uh -huh. and I had made a little skull, a little ASCII skull, <laughs> that shot lasers out of its eyes. Cool. And I could move it around the screen, and when, when I and, and I press a button to shoot lasers out of its eyes. But I didn't know. I couldn't figure out how to make two things happen at the same time. So, the skull disappeared while the lasers were traveling down. <laughs> and then when the lasers finished, then the skull would come back. And then, all right, <laughs> it could be gameplay. Yeah. All right. All right it cool. was a thing. All right. Did it have a name? No. All right. <laughs> skull game. Uh, so, um, all right. Well, didn't have any challenges either. I didn't have anything to shoot at. Oh, I mean, just shooting. <laughs> just, just shooting. Just running lasers. around and shooting things. All right, well, Easy, yeah. easy game. Um, so you, uh, was there anything when you were between, you know, your kid and playing D&D &D and you went to college, was there anything that happened formatively to kind of push you towards that before you got to college? No. Uh, in fact, um, all through high school and through the first part of college, my goal was to be a comic book writer and artist. Oh, sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, very familiar. <laughs> I knew there's some reason I liked you. Yeah, uh, both have <laughs> bad career choices. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, where we got us? I, well, you know, uh, that's where it got us. <laughs> got us making video games. <laughs> it wasn't until um, so I got to college. I went to UCLA. Uh, I got to college and uh, made a bunch of friends through the science fiction club there, and science fiction and fantasy and gaming and all that. So playing D and D. 
led to other sorts of games. We played a lot of uh, board games. I, I remember playing a lot of, um, of uh, uh, like, uh, um, Fury of Dracula uh, board game. Yeah. Uh, we played a lot of... Um, Is that where you discovered Scotland Yard? No, actually. So you, so you played Fury of Dracula first? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. Scotland Yard is an older game. Uh, my, many of my students know know about it because I use it in classes. But uh, uh, some of my students don't yet know how much they love Scotland Yard. <laughs> <laughs> they will learn. Oh, yes, they will learn. How much I love it. so <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so we played a lot of games, a lot of games. Uh, we started... Uh, we started playing around with, with what would end up being, being called LARPs. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, they, they hadn't been, the, the name hadn't sort of coalesced around them. We were calling them just live interactive games. And the idea was... Lips. I oh, know. Legs. legs. <laughs> they were legs. Legs, yeah. <laughs> Not as good. Yeah. Uh, the idea was that they were a, sort of an extension of our D&D of our games where we could actually like, dress as our characters and we'd have a party. And like, then we'd be at a tavern, and then the GM would have things happen for us in the tavern, and that was sort of fun, and that was kind of cool. But and we were literally rolling dice on the floor, and <laughs> like it was, it was, it, it was, it was very clumsy. And we soon realized that this is too clumsy. We need to come up with better mechanics for this, yeah. and that sort of steamrolled into more of these games. We ended up, uh, myself and uh, a handful of other people at that club, ended up running probably. 20 or 30 LARPs over the next three or four years. Wow. You guys were way I mean, we were super, su and super early days, and, and they were all one-shot LARPs. Um, we had upwards of, I think one of the largest ones we had was like 60 players. Wow. So they would take us several months to, to, to write all the characters and figure out all the inter interconnections and put together all the mechanics. And Did you ever go into the sewer systems? Uh, not the not the the, uh, the steam tunnels. Not the oh, the steam tunnels. The steam tunnels. There are steam tunnels supposedly under UCLA. And and supposedly I've never been in them. <laughs> <laughs> supposedly you've never killed a goblin in there either. <laughs> we never actually played down there though. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, it was fun enough just to go and explore. All right. Supposedly. Supposedly. <laughs> All right. Um, so when you were at UCLA, you studied design. Yes. Now, did you just study design in the sense of artistic design, like graphic design, or did you yeah. study game design? That's right. It was um, the design department was um, uh, basically a half step to the right of the art department. Mm. Uh, we were in the same building as the art department. The art department sort of had four specialties, which were drawing, painting, sculpture, and new forms, uh, which was performance art. Uh, and then the design department, we did graphics, uh, ceramics, textiles, and product design. And so we had to do a little bit of all of that as bachelor's degrees for that. And then I actually stayed a little bit longer at UCLA and went, there was a, there was a three quarter undergraduate animation section that I did and I, did it, I made an animated film I spent a little bit extra time at UCLA to, to do that. So I, I graduated in like five years. And you, and you said you also did bookbinding, right? Was yeah, that... so actually one of, the, uh, one of the really cool things that happened uh, is they, hi they, they hired us just sort of like, here's a strange thing to add to the design curriculum. Uh, art, artists, like hand-bound bookmaking. And they hired this artist guy who had, who had made a bunch of hand-bound books, and he came and he taught, and it was like a, a six-hour class on Fridays. So it was a strange class. It was like, normally we met, uh, the classes would meet twice a week, and, but this one was like once a week, and we had like this huge amount of time. And I got really into this, um, where it was basically artist books. You're we making, making artist books. But at that point, I was even starting to think about interactivity. Mm -hmm. Um, because a book, unlike a painting or something, is something you actually have to touch. You actually have to interact with it. You have to, you have to uh, you know, turn pages to see what comes next. And so uh, I made a bunch of books. And uh, the height of my art career, my like the, the my art career, was that I got some of those books got accepted into a year long show at the Anchorage Museum of Art and History. I think so. They had a they had a year long sort of exhibit of book arts, and I had a, had two of my books shown. And did you go up to Anchorage to see them? I did not. Oh, why not? I was poor. Yeah, I don't know. All right. So, uh, <laughs> what, am so I, what am I, Rockefeller? Yeah, I don't know. 
Uh, I didn't know you at the time. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, how did that artistic? Because it, I, I, I mean, when you've described it to me, it always sounds like it's like an art degree, right? Yeah, um, yeah, it very much is an art degree. How did that help you with game design later on? So, uh, interestingly, um, there was a class that that everybody had to take uh, in the in the design program, and none of us liked it, and it was it was this long, 10-week rambling lecture about media mm. and about how, and how media experiences, and none of us got it. I didn't, start, I didn't start getting his lecture until like about 10 years ago. <laughs> I started thinking about his lectures and getting like, oh, I think I know what he was getting at now. And it was about, and it was about these sort of mediated experiences and, so, and about how we, we create you know, we create these things, but we don't necessarily know how they're going to be taken by the people who see them or play with them or hear them or read them or whatever well, it is that no you're doing. You have no control over that. You have no control of it at all. Uh, you're trying to create an experience. They're going to take the thing and they're going to get. They're going to have an experience with it, but it's going to be it's it's going to be a mediated experience. And so, le- learning like to a certain degree. Game design, and design in general, but game design probably even more specifically because it's so much about the experience of the thing, uh, is really like understanding how to, how to, how to sort of control that and how to, uh, how to understand how people have experiences and how to use that when, when you're creating something so that you know how these experiences are going to be get, understood. Get them to play the game you want them to play. Yeah. Right. Yeah, or use the product how you want them to use it, or whatever. I remember him. I remember him showing us this weird contraption that was like, it was basically a, a clear plastic cube about this big that had sort of a, a. It was open on one side, but had this sort of plunger side, and uh, and he would pass it around, and he would and and he would say, "What do you think this is?" And like none of us would have any idea what this thing was, and it was. It was, an, it was a device to make cube hard-boiled eggs. That. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. Like, if you don't know what that is, you don't know what that is. You have no idea. Right. Right. And so... Who eats square hard-boiled eggs? Right. I well, know. I mean, who, who would want this? I mean, that's another question. Like, who is this for? Well, it's, right? what, it's for those people that have a fear of circles. <laughs> yeah. Right. And or want or want to build you know fortresses, right? Egg fortresses. Egg fortresses. I don't know. Yeah. Bricks. They're ma- you're making egg bricks. Egg bricks. Yes. <laughs> All right. But there's a big que- there's lots of questions about that, right? There's lots of questions about why is why does it exist? <laughs> why, you know, why does it exist? Um, what did they? Why did they decide to make it like this? Right. Uh, why did they decide to make it at all? Right. Uh, uh, and but why I mean, did your it teacher probably, buy it? It costs it costs ten cents or whatever. You know, oh, it's like a, a small, a, bargain. a tiny amount of plastic that, that somebody could sell for probably three or four dollars. Right. And uh, and you know, maybe you sell a thousand of them, and that's okay. To design educators. To design educators. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the audience. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So um, so from an art degree at UCLA, how did you get into video games? Right. So this is where I get lucky. Um, I, I left UCLA, I went out and I was working in advertising. I worked at uh, uh, a theater company, like a, a, a movie theater, art house movie theater company um, in their advertising department and uh, learning about sort of the, the business of movies from that, from that end of it, from art, art house movies particularly. And this was in the early 90s, so sort of the, the big boom in art house movies going on. It was, you know. Tarantino. And- Tarantino, yeah, he was, he was getting his, his start. And uh, uh, Cinema Paradiso was, was the big hit. And, uh, you know, a bunch of those sorts of movies were, were sort of making these art house movie theaters a lot of money. And by a lot of money, we're talking about a, a small trickle of the money that regular movie theaters were making. Ah, just like board gaming. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've, I've been chasing the trickle end of the river my entire career. <laughs> it's like your story. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, in my, in my spare time, while I was doing, when I wasn't, wasn't at work, I was still playing role-playing games and running LARPs for my friends. And 
Uh, I was running a big LARP for the, based on the Sandman comic books, so Neil Gaiman Sandman comics. Uh, and one of the gals that was playing in the LARP, she was playing Queen Titania. She was very excited about this, and she was, uh, I guess, talking it up at where she worked, and she was a temp receptionist at a game company. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, we need, some, we need, a, des- we need a game designer. We're, we've, got, we, we've got some games, and we'd, and we'd like to hire a game designer. And she's like, well, I'll put you in touch. And so they did. Uh, she did, and, uh, they, and that was my first, so that was my first lucky break. Nice. Um, I had to really pitch them hard to, to, because to, I didn't have any sort of like video game experience. They were making games for uh, 3DO. Oh, is this so uh, early, early Veritas? Handheld. Yes, this was Veritas. All right. And what did, what kind of game? What games were you working on for them? I worked on a game. Nothing that ever came out. Oh, okay. Uh, I worked on. They had a. a they were their, the company. So they were a small indie developer. Uh, the publisher that they were working for was. A Korean publisher, and so the Korean publisher, we had pitched, and the Korean publisher had re- had, had accepted an idea about um, about Korean mythology. So there was basically going to be like a fantasy adventure game uh, set in Korean mythology about these wolves. And the wolf, there was some, there was a fire wolf that came up and took a bite out of the moon, and so we were sort of running with that. And I mean, it wasn't, it was very thinly based on on that story. Uh, but I ended up designing that. Um, they hired me. They hired an art director, and they hired a a, a writer, actually a novelist, um, to write the story, and for me to p- figure out the gameplay and the and the artist to figure out what it looked like. Uh, this company had this strange. Uh, they had a strange process where the design team, basically me and these other two guys, would put together a design document. And it was extremely detailed. Um, and we, uh, uh, like every detail of everything that, that happens in this game. And it was really, it was honestly a really good experience to have in the first time because uh, the, the creative director for that company, a woman named Anna Roth, uh, was extremely particular about making sure every, every I was dotted, every T was crossed. Um, and, we, when, and we had three months to do this. Mm. And we got it done. And then they passed it to a production team. And we were done. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, and what happened to the production team? Well, they would look at it and go, we have no idea what this is. Uh. <laughs> There's no prototype. Of, like, like right. Literally, it's just a design document. It was about this thick. Was, was the production team in the building? <laughs> yes, but we weren't. Okay. Because we were, it was a temp job to hire. To design oh, and game. then you were out, and we're done. Oh, out, out. Okay, all right. <laughs> I think they, I think they hired the artist, the lead artist, right, to co- to come back, Makes and, sense. and continue making it. But and so then they had to sort of figure out, well, based on this document, what should we make? Oh gosh. And there wasn't, and when we were making the, des- when we were designing it, we didn't have any sort of budgets in mind. Where there's no like, sure. So you just so made like whatever. Everything. It's like, hey, let's put let's put more stuff in this. Right. Why not? Right. Words are easy. They're cheap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can write a lot of words. Exactly. So they had the they had to then figure out, and so it was not it was not a it was not a great production process. Is what I'm saying. It was right. an early attempts, and then the Korean uh, publisher went out of business, yes. and uh, and then and, and then so the V that, and in Veritas they, stood for vaporware. Yeah, exactly. Ah, that's too bad. So yeah, it didn't it didn't go anywhere, but it gave me a handful of people that I knew now in the industry, right. and one of them led to. Uh, a job at Activision where I worked on Muppet Treasure Island. Right. And that was the first game that actually got published that I worked on. Right. And what was that like writing for characters that you like? Well, um, so it was, so this job that I had was again, a a very short lived job. Uh, I was just a consultant. They had writers. Were you a Muppet consultant? I was a Muppet consultant. Okay. Um, (laughs) um, The, uh, they, they had this sort of branching narrative project where it was basically like as you made choices like a graphic adventure game yeah but they didn't know how to organize the script Hmm. so they didn't know how to like like piece it together so i basically came through and basically took their script apart and put it back together uh in such a way that they could see where the holes were where they needed more 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 script to be filled in Uh, and that was probably a month or two 
And, uh, and that was basically all I was doing. Right. It was just basically taking apart their, their linear script and putting it together in a, in a non-linear way. Right. And, but then they came out. And they came out. And so you had a credit. Yep. And they said, we want to hire you back. Nope. No. But it, <laughs> so who said, we want to hire you next? So the next, the next uh, I, I got lucky again. So after the Activision thing, I basically blanketed the Los Angeles area with, my, with resumes. Right. And um, a company called Seventh Level, was here in Burbank, uh, uh, found my resume and thought that I was a programmer. And I'm not a programmer. <laughs> Um, and so they called me in for an interview. Right. And then on the on the morning of the interview, uh, hey, you made a skull game. I did, <laughs> and that's as about as far as my my programming went. Yeah. Okay. I did learn a little bit more on the Apple II, and I, still, I did a little bit more programming in Basic on the Apple IIs, uh, but that was about it. Right. Okay. Um, so we're, we're how far into the test were you when they realized you weren't a programmer? Oh no, not even to the test. Oh, okay. It's just like the he. I got to the interview, he looked at my resume again, and then within like 30 seconds he said, why am I interviewing you? <laughs> that's, that's a great feeling to have when you're in an interview, right? Confident, real confidence builder. Uh, but he did send me to uh, their, 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 the head of their creative department. Oh, good. And it turns out that this company had just signed a deal with a novelist named Raymond Feist. Mm -hmm. Uh, who has written a bunch of uh, uh, Midkemia, the series of, of Midkemia novels. And they had signed a deal maybe a week earlier. They had one guy on their payroll who knew anything at all about role-playing games. They wanted to make a sequel to the role-playing game. There, there had been a role-playing game that Sierra had put out mm -hmm. called um, Betrayal at Crondor that had been a big hit. Yeah. PC role-playing game. This is mid-90s. And uh, they didn't have anybody but this one programmer guy, and he was busy. So he wasn't going to be able to get to anything very soon. And, there, and, he, and the creative guy looked at my resume and said, you're a role-playing game guy, right? I'm like, yes, I am. And they hired me. Nice. There and you go. D&D paid off. D&D paid Take off. Take that, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, return, so how long did you work on Return to Crondor? So that was uh, like a two and a half, three year process. Wow. All right, that's good. Um, Steady I was work. initially hired on to be as like a design assistant. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was nobody to assist, so they made, made me a designer. And then the company was growing really fast because this was the CD-ROM boom days. And uh, the, uh, the, the guy who was running the project uh, got sucked up into a, into a vice president position, and I got sucked up into the producer position way too early. And, uh, um, but it was good. I mean, I, I got a, uh, we, we did a lot of really, really cool stuff with that game. And it did finally come out. Another producer had to come in and step in at the end to, to finish it because there was, like, I just didn't have the skills. I didn't have the production skills to do it. Um, and it, it came out, and it did pretty well. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I feel pretty good. I still feel pretty good about that game yeah. in some ways. There were some rookie mistakes I made in that game, but... Uh, you were a rookie. I was a rookie. Tell me, Andy, how does one move up as a game designer? <laughs> <laughs> how does one? You know, well, the, you have the answer. Well, I just told you. No, the other you answer. Got, you let somebody else the other answer, get sucked up into the... <laughs> the other answer is... Uh, just iterate. You fight your way up a couple of levels oh, and okay, kill the boss, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so two and a half years, game designer on your resume. Awesome. Right. So you go on to a game. So I, I know a little bit about this game. If, yep. I, if I'm not mistaken, I might be a little confused, but... The Florigan brothers, Floygan, Floygan brothers, right? No R. Floygan brothers. Floygan. Now, was that was that? Were you working with Dave Siller on that? No. No. Okay. Because Dave, I thought Dave Siller was involved in that somehow. But anyway, I'm, so this I know I, nothing about this. You Dave know nothing Siller. about this person. All right, that's fine. Um, I remember hearing about this game at the time because I think I was working at Namco, and I was the word had come down that this was like extremely ambitious game. Like it had yeah. a reputation even before it was out of it being this extremely ambitious video game. So yeah. tell us about this, and this was something that you designed. Yes. So um, uh, Visual Concepts up in the uh, Bay Area, up in Marin County, uh, hired me to come in and design this project. Um, it was going to be basically their answer to Mario. Right. Um, uh, it, Spoiler alert, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which is why you might... How many of you have heard of Flagan Brothers? 
Anyone? No, yeah, nah. there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Visual Concepts is best known for being the company that makes the 2K sports titles. Right. So um, they had this machine, basically, this, this production machine that every year cranked out uh, a, uh, a football game, a basketball game, and a, and a, uh, and a baseball game. Right. And those games, I was, I, was, I was mentioning this to my class earlier this week, these games, they have to come out every year and they have to hit the beginning of the season. If they're late, you're screwed. So then there's plenty of time for design creativity. <laughs> there's plenty of design. There's, well, what they do is they sort of, they, they sort of layer them, right? right? They iterate. They, well, they're not, beyond that, they're, they're designing two years ahead of what they're actually producing. So the things that they're designing now are probably not going to make it into this one, but they'll probably make it in the next one or the next one after that. Um, and this was for the, the, the Dreamcast launch. So uh, also, Flagon Brothers was meant to be a Dreamcast launch title. It was not. Spoiler <laughs> alert number two. Uh, <laughs> uh, but because, uh, this, the, because of the production, the strenuous production required to make these sports titles, my, produ my programmers on my team would get sucked off to work on sports titles, and then I'd get them back again. Yes. And then they'd get sucked off to work on some sports title, and I'd get them back again. And so as a result, my game was a lot smaller and, uh, and a lot later than anybody ever anticipated. Uh, but what was really cool about it, and this was something, I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm particularly proud of. It took us a while to figure out. The, the game is about, it's a cartoony adventure game. You play, uh, there's two brothers, the Flegan brothers. You play the small, smart one, and then there's this big, goofy... Uh, uh, of mice and men sort of thing going on. We, the you know, character is very much modeled on, on uh, of mice and men. And, uh, and he's an AI. The big guy's an AI. And he needs to be able to, he needed to be able to be uh, autonomous and not just like stand there while you did stuff and then you could poke him to make him do stuff. He had to be actually have his own Agenda, wants and yeah. needs and things. And... Um, uh, there had been a lot of work done uh, at MIT on AIs that were need-based AIs. So we built basically a need-based AI. So he'd get hungry, he'd get sleepy, he'd get um, uh, he'd get needy. He'd get he 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 start he would need affection. <laughs> uh, he needed like like social interaction. Uh, and so we had these needs, and they were slowly going up and down all the time. And you could do stuff with him to satisfy these needs. And that would make him happy, or make, or if you, if you, if he asked you to do stuff with him that would satisfy these needs, uh, he'd get mad at you, and he'd beat you up, and he'd beat you up, yeah. uh, and uh, and you could use all of these different states to get things done around this junkyard that they lived in. So they lived in a junkyard, and there was an evil guy that was sending cats in to invade the junkyard. And there was a, there was a little story that went along with it too, and the. And, uh, and you have to do these things. You have to play these little games with him to get, get him to do stuff. And, and, uh, and that AI, I haven't seen another AI like that AI since. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I mean, even games like... Uh, he felt really real, too. Yeah, uh, like, well, like The Last of Us and um, uh, Bioshock Infinite. Like, they always claim, oh, it's going to be this really helpful, interesting, interactive secondary character and yeah I've never seen another character with that like where the gameplay revolves around that other character right well and that's the key to it honestly we realized that it can't be a gameplay type that we had seen where you have an AI to help you because what do you need help doing if you're like if you if you're Mario but a Mario that needs help doing stuff then you're not really Mario, right? Mario doesn't really need help to do stuff. Uh, <laughs> so you're it had to be a it had to be a different kind of game. It had to be a game where the AI interacting with the AI was literally the primary thing that you did. Right. It wasn't you know a run and jump game with an AI that helped you. It, it was an AI game. It was an interact with this AI game that would help you do other stuff. Right. So how long did you guys work on that? Uh, that one was another. Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you, it was. 10 months too long because we came out uh, if, some of you may remember the Dreamcast had a, a viable shelf life of, of exactly one year 
um, from the time that it launched in, uh, in 99 to September of 2000, uh, it was pretty much dead. Yeah. Um, part of that was because the Xbox had been announced. Uh, Microsoft had helped Sega uh, launch the Dreamcast. And then as soon as it was launched, they said, wow, that was great. Now we know how to do this. Yeah. Uh, and, and PlayStation was getting stronger. And PlayStation it had been around was getting for stronger. Three or four years by that point. Right, 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 so. right. And N64 had been around for a few years at this point. So right. that, and then Mar a Mario game then for the N64. So it's right. like, why do we need another Mario when we have the Mario? We're right. And right. so, uh, as a result, the game was not the Mario killer that that the company had wanted it to be. Uh, it was not on time, and so by the time it came out, the Dreamcast. If you went into a GameStop and you went to the very back, there was always a pillar that held the ceiling up, and right behind that was where the Dreamcast <laughs> stuff was, right. and that's where my game was. And so I think twelve people bought this game. <sighs> yeah, there's nothing like that feeling. What are you gonna do? Going into the GameStop or the Blockbuster <laughs> Video and. Even better, seeing your game on clearance oh, right. for like a quarter of the price of what it went for. Yeah, good times. Good I was movie. very surprised. So uh, soon, soon after it launched, um, uh, I um, I got a ping from a headhunter looking for somebody to come down to um, a Sony Santa Monica studio, mm -hmm. and I took the job because I couldn't imagine that Visual Concepts would want me around. Um, this was before the game shipped? Or uh, no, as? no, no, uh, right after. Oh, okay. Right after. Uh, and did they go on and make Flagon Brothers 2? They did not. They didn't have any plan to, but they were still kind of surprised that I left. Oh, really? Yeah. I was like, like literally, like the, when, I, when I gave them my resignation, they were like, what? They were like, don't you want to come work on football 2001? Well, right. <laughs> Or 2002, yeah. or 2003, uh, or 2004, or 2000. Sports ball, right? Sports ball. Sports ball. Yeah. Sports ball 2K. Yeah, that's Andy we have. Draft. Sports ball 2K. That's right. <laughs> Feel the sports or the balls. One of the two. All right. So you go on to Sony, Santa Monica. Yep. And you work on possibly one of my favorite PlayStation 2 games ever, which is War of the Monsters. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. And what did you do for War of the Monsters? So I came on at the very end of that production. All right. Um, we were, they were still basically designing some extra monsters. I got to, I got to poke, poke my hand into, into that process. Put your hand into a monster. Into designing the monsters that, that you end up, uh, end up getting. What to was play. the monster you created? Um, well, I, I, I helped guide the creation of uh -huh. uh, the robot monster who looks uh -huh. very much like a Mazinga. I like that one. Yeah. Like, was uh, he on the cover? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. He's nice. Yeah. Um, there was. Uh, 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 sort of the Godzilla monster. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was. There was a crab monster that I got. I got to to play around with. Um, that one had a really interesting. So that was also that one ended up being the first time that I started really thinking. Well, that's not true. Flagon Brothers had a. Uh, uh, I started really getting into cameras. So cameras in three D adventure games and in any sort of like how to how to make cameras work in a three D environment. Um, in Flagon Brothers. The challenge was you wanted to frame the picture so that your character was in it, where you were going was in the picture, and your brother was in the picture whenever possible. It's a lot of long shots. It was a lot of, so it was a lot of, and so we had come up with this, with this sort of a fairly arcane system. It was a follow camera basically, but it was a follow camera that you could control a little bit and it would, and then when you were not in control of it, it would do its best to give you the best view of, of all three of those things. Your character, where your character was going. If your character was standing still, that's easy. Your character is going where he is. But as soon as you start moving, it starts projecting a, a ray out ahead of you and going, how far, how far ahead do I need to look? Right. So it's and constantly then, triangulating where this was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in 3D space, because right. the, the world wasn't flat. The world had hills, and, oh, and, be, right. and you can get behind stuff. Platforms. And like, yeah, platforms, and you can get behind the house, and so the camera would, would swing around to, to, and, to and show. And we get caught and stutter on the... No, no we didn't. fixed that. Oh, we that's good. Get, we didn't right. get any... We, had, we, even, we even built this, this, this spot in the level that... Um, and we, we had a hide-and-seek game where you played hide-and-seek with your brother. And we had a spot in the level that was this sort of U-shaped, basically a screen. 
And it was literally there just to test our camera. Yeah. It was our, our like, here's the worst case scenario for our camera. Let's put Moigel, your brother, Moigel, uh, uh, in, the, in this spot and see where the camera, how the camera can find him. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And no stuttering. Good job. Yeah. And so, and so um, War of the Monsters had a really interesting problem. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, you remember it, but I, maybe maybe some of you do as well. Um, you're, it's a it's a two player fighting game. You're fight, you're you're giant monsters. You're fighting in a city. When you are separate, the 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 screen would split into a split screen. Yeah. Um, when you got together, it would merge back together into a single screen. Yeah, like what it does in Little Big Planet and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So we had, um, and depending on on like how you separated, like let's say. You know, you're playing together, you're fighting together, but then you separate. Depending on which way you separate, the screen would split right. either this way or this way. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, to give you, to, so that it would basically follow follow the two characters. Uh, and so that was really interesting. Yeah, it was a great solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah it worked out. Yeah, it was good. Uh, it's almost like you studied that stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, almost. <laughs> but I, at that point, I was still sort of, I was still new at that. Yeah, well, all those movies at the... Theater. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe that. <laughs> so, so you went on to from War of the Monsters to Warhawk. Warhawk. Obviously, you had to work on every game with war in the title. That's right. And in between, there was uh, uh, Neopets. Oh right. The Darkest Fairy. Well, wait. Is that when I met you? Was Neop? Because yeah, I met you. I you were so. on Neopets. Yeah, I think so. Oh okay. I didn't realize it was. But you were there a while before I met you. Yeah. Because I got there in two thousand four. Oh, there was a bunch of there was a bunch of projects that never went anywhere. Oh okay. Um, what was the best one? Uh, the Flash. I oh, don't like this comic book one. Yeah, yeah. Oh. We, we uh, uh, there was a company um, that had brought uh, a demo, basically a tech demo to us that was um, the super awesome whirlwind. They basically that was the name of the game. No, no, no. It oh. was like the tech demo just showed what their what their what their three D engine could do, and they showed it by showing us this tornado hitting this farmhouse and just blowing it, just, like, just, just turning it to smithereens. And it was like, you know, and, and everything's moving around, and it was like, it was astounding. Yeah. And, um, and I was like, Weather Wizard. Oh, yeah. yeah I yeah. need to make a Flash game with this company. Right. So we pitched it. Um, Sony was on board. Um, the company, of course, was on board because they'd, they'd come to us wanting work. So they were like, yes, sounds great. Um, and then we started working. We started uh, working with DC Comics to get the license for it, and it turns out that they wanted way too much. So this was, by the way, this was way before there was the Flash TV show. Uh, well, it was after the TV, the first TV show. No, it was prior. yeah. The first one was eighty nine oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or Sorry, was ninety. Yes. Right. And you were there, and this it was, was like two thousand and two. Right, but before the good one. Yes, before the good one. Right. Um, and so we, we were like. They wanted they wanted an astounding amount of money for it, um, and my boss at the time, uh, Mike Guillaume, uh <laughs> now teaches at uh, 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 a school. I've forgotten a school. Um, he's another game designer. He's very smart, and yeah, he was he a great is. boss. Um, and he said uh, we were looking we were looking at the numbers, so basically calculating how many units we'd have to sell in order to be able to pay this this licensing fee. And still make money on our part, on our side. Uh, and and he said, "Well, oh, shit. If we're gonna have to kick that much ass, we might as well use our own boot." <laughs> 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 and so that's so good. That's so good. Uh, yeah, I mean. So did you, why, you did you try to make your own boot? Uh, or, no. Or did you just go forget yeah, I mean, it? Yeah, we just yeah, because oh. the, the whole point of it was like. Tornado went to Weather Wizard, went to Flash. So, at some point, you're like, could have gone. Tornado goes to some other speedy Mr. character, Mr. Tornado Man, or Sonic something. the Tornado, yeah. or yeah, it just didn't. All right, well, that's too bad. We did get a demo out of it that was that was actually pretty good. Oh yeah. Um, oh, there, there was another aspect to it too, which was um, we realized I realized that um, there was no way to design. Basic gameplay that would that could just be used for you know for twenty hours. Everything was going to be have to be, have to be handcrafted, right? Because you're the the idea was that the character was moving around really fast, 
And as you leveled up, you got faster and you could do more in the same amount of time. And it was all going, like every, every scenario had to be this sort of handcrafted thing. Right. Uh, and so that was just going to be, <clears throat> it was going to be too expensive well, to do that. That's because you overlooked the most obvious solution. And that is surround Central City with gas and then make the flesh run through rings. <laughs> and that's the whole game. That's the whole game. That's the running, whole game is just running flash through running through rings and, and then the gas. You can put ramps and do loops. No, no, like no, that's too much, oh, too much on. effort. Come and on. then the gas obscures distance and so that way you don't have to draw too much of the distance. Oh, we you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Superman 64 reference, thank you. Yeah. Somebody got it. All right, uh, so uh, you worked on Neopets, that's when I met mm -hmm. you. What were you doing on that game? Um, uh, external development, so I was working with the external development group, um, which meant that they basically paired up a producer and a designer to go, with, go work with these uh, independent developers to make games, um, and so, uh, we were going to publish the Neopets game, but it wasn't. We weren't developing it ourselves. Another developer was doing it, um, and so we went and basically sort of oversaw the whole process. That's that's when you were a loft person. Yes. All right. That's yeah, when I first. The, the met. Sony, the studio had a loft, so basically, like I was up there while he was down. I was here. trolling away in the pits, <laughs> in the salt mines, and you were in just sipping champagne up in the that's on right. the trellis. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, do you recommend anybody who works in game? Do you like that was your first experience doing like creative manager or yeah. that type of position? Yeah. Do you recommend that for people that are interested in development, or do you, I mean, like, was it useful to you to to learn how to do that skill? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it was. Uh, I liked working on a lot of different projects. So, as an external development, you know, like working that way, I wasn't on a single game. I was on two or three different games at any given time some of which might be in like late stage development, some might be in the middle stage development, um, some might be early on in which you're, you're really, and some of them might need, and they need different kinds of help. Like in some cases, they might need a lot of help. Uh, in some cases, they're like, you guys got this. I, don't, I barely need to look at this. I, it's fine, it's okay. gonna be fine. Let it, just let them go. Just let them go, right? And in some cases, they don't have, like some, some developers didn't even have a designer. I was the one doing the design Doing the doing the design for them, going back, meeting with them, pitching it to them. I spent a lot of time in Salt Lake City, right. working with the on, when when we were working with Warhawk. Cause that that was a game that was made with um, uh, Incognito, right? I think so. yeah, yeah, Incognito in in, in Salt Lake City, and uh, they didn't have any designers out there, so we were basically designing the game here, and then going out there. Like not, working with them to make them understand how the design worked. Not allowed to design in Utah, is that the? Uh, I guess. <laughs> or that's nobody, what, nobody willing to to move out there and work for them. Yeah, well, that's true. I interviewed out there and <laughs> stayed here. Uh, it's lovely in the springtime. It is very lovely in the springtime. Um, all right. So after you um, were doing this production or publishing position, right. you somehow got roped into God of War 2. And I've never well, heard this story. How did you oh, okay. How did you so, transition back into the salt mine with the rest of the... Uh, so um, Warhawk, so my, my position on Warhawk was to design the, um, the campaign, the single player campaign. Uh, how many of you have played Warhawk? How many of you have played the single player campaign of Warhawk? No, kind of, I don't it didn't know. ship with one. All right, <laughs> <laughs> did not. Obviously, that's why I don't uh, remember one. <laughs> right, right. So um, there had been a bunch of problems with the production, and I won't necessarily go into a lot of details on it, um, except that I predicted it early, and they didn't they, listen to you, and they found me another job Ooh. in the same company, which was how I got on God of War. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. I'm... So so that's and then uh, uh, by the way I got an official apology afterwards. Like, that's good. Like three months three months after from Alan started, or someone else. Um, uh, no, from uh, from Shannon oh, and okay. Brian. All right. Well, because I had I had sort of come down kind of hard on the developers at one point um, when they were asking to push back the schedule, and 
And they had given me, they had reprimanded, they had given me an official reprimand for being negative. Congratulations. And, uh, and, then, and then, so they moved me off and they put me on, on God of War. God of War was in its crunch mode and so it was going into like this, this, this time. They needed help, that's fine. Um, I was fine to move on to it. I was perfectly happy doing it. Yes, but you don't know how much it amuses me that God of War was your punishment. Because <laughs> that's very appropriate. So, and, uh, so you did cameras for God of War 2. Yeah. And did you so, do any game? So, so the apology came three months later when the, when the developers wanted to push back, and oh. push out the, the schedule again, and they still didn't know for how long. And, uh, and, and I got an official, hey, we're, what we said before was, we want to apologize for. Well, that's. So I got an apology big. for the reprimand. That's good for of that. Yeah, it was so nice. All right. I mean. All right. I mean, a pyrrhic victory. Right? Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> got to take away you can in the industry. Uh, so, God of War Two. You did camera work. Did yes. you do any gameplay stuff for it? Or no, no. It was all at this point. It was all. Uh, it was all camera stuff. Um, again, I was very happy to um, to be working on on cameras. Uh, the cameras in God of War were all. Designer controlled, so we had this this huge tool set that had been built um, and pl as plugins to Maya, and the entire game was built in Maya. Um, it was still had... like two and a half D, right? When on the second one, kind no. of. Did they? Did, was it full three D by that point? Full three D, yeah. Was it? Because the second one had kind of fixed, like the camera was like the back walls of stuff were like scene sets in the original one. Um, we, we didn't have full 360-degree camera in oh, the first one. Well, right. So it's because it's all designer-controlled, it meant that there are places where the world doesn't have to exist. Right. And so we were working very closely with the artists. Uh, and this is the same in, in 1 and 2, and probably 3 and 4 and 5 as well, um, uh, where we controlled the view. When you come into a room, the camera would be up here, and they'd, we'd see Kratos come in, and... If you walk this way, we we could we could control the camera to like follow you this way. Or if you walk this way, we could control the camera to come down and look over your shoulder this way. We could do we had like full control over what the camera did, depending on what the player does. And as a result, it meant that there were sections of the world that we that you never saw. Right. You never it was there was no player controlled camera. You could never turn the camera around and look at stuff that you. That, um, and it also meant that, and this was the really interesting part of it. Because it's designer controlled, it meant you had to think about very carefully what you wanted the player to see at any given time, and I thought, and that was really, really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and I learned a lot doing that because my initial my initial instinct, as somebody who played a lot of board games and and role playing games and stuff where I'm, I'm I'm looking at tactics on a tabletop or whatever, my instinct was to pull the camera back to let the player see more. But the correct way to do this, and the way that, and the reason why God of War I think is as, as good and popular as it is, is because the camera, the, the, the creative director brought the camera in as close as possible. Well, it made everything seem bigger and more epic. And, and everything seems more, more bigger, more epic, more personal, yeah. and pulls you into the, into the action more. And understanding the rich, complex tapestry that is Kratos. That's right. His emotional inner His, life. Yes, that <laughs> deep psychology in that game. But but and and, on, and honestly, the the answer was like, if if the player gets lost, we just need to add another camera. Right. So uh, so you know, at any given point, depending on what's happening, there might be a fight going on or whatever, and yeah. and things are moving around, and if. If you get if if it gets to if you're playing it and it just feels like you're just like too into it and you don't know what's happening you could just pull back the camera a little bit and, and then and then and then come back into so it was really interesting it was a, it was it was fascinating um, uh, I was I was ultimately very pleased to work on the on, yeah, on that great. game yeah. Yeah, and there I... were basically three other or two other camera designers besides me there was a lead who had been doing it from the get go and then another guy that had come on about the same time I did. Who was the lead? Um, uh, Mark Simon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank's brother. Okay. Yeah, Frank was my roommate. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's a long story. Uh, all right, so uh, did you work on three at all? Yes, and I worked... Um, Same so, thing, or...? Uh, no, I was actually... I Actually, the, they pulled me into level design oh. on three, 
But it was very early days, and within a month or two, I moved. Uh, I took a job at THQ. Right. I followed you to THQ. Yes, and we all know how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so uh, some of the games that you worked on at THQ, you right. worked on Locks Quest. Locks Quest, which was with Fifth Cell. Yep. War of the um, uh, World of Zoo. World of Zoo, which is one of your favorites, right? Yeah, that, the war, the game that I was originally pulled into work with was um, the company that made Zoo Tycoon. So this was another external development job. So I was working uh, my 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 actual title. Our actual titles um, were creative director, and uh, again they would pair a producer and a creative director up and go work with these uh, these external developers. On various things, and uh, uh, and we had multiple games, each of us on uh, on our on our roster of things to work on, and uh, uh, one of the one that literally the, the one that I was brought in to work with was uh, was with um, the company that made Zoo Tycoon mm-hmm. um, was was leaving Microsoft, who owned the Zoo Tycoon franchise, and we had hired them to make another zoo game. Like these people know zoos, they know zoo games. The Let's hot genre, a, of, the zoo hot zoo genre of zoo games. <laughs> For a uh, hot second. And uh, they, uh, and so we world we we made a, a Wii game uh, for kids, a kids game called World of Zoo, where you could ba- basically build out your zoo, and it became sort of a pet. It was a mix, more a mixture of a petting zoo, and and were and sort of like park builder than it was a simulator. So we we sort of left behind all the simulation stuff of it, and went more into like let's 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 play with the animals. Let's let's make a game where you can play with the animals. Kind of like a Tamagotchi in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I guess or, like, without without the heartbreak, right. <laughs> <laughs> and less poop cleaning. Uh, no, there's still poop. Fair bit of poop. A little bit fair of poop. bit of poop to clean up. Yeah. All right. yeah. Um, so you were there for? What, was there? Were there any other major games? Did you do Conan or? No, no, I didn't work on Conan. Yeah, I, yeah, I worked a little bit on Dark Siders. Uh, oh, that's you right, did yeah. as well. Yeah, Dark Siders. Uh, and, although uh, I, I mean, barely, barely worked. I mean, that that team was pretty well. Uh, they were pretty, pretty well covered for the most part. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the Locks Quest, which was working with Fifth Cell. Yep. So, um, so Fifth Cell had two big hits. And I did the game, I worked with them on the game right between those two. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, you know where the idea for that game came from, right? Uh, uh, besides a million years of, uh, of anime, what? Uh, it was, it, it, I'm, I'm taking a tiny bit of credit for it because they were wondering what to do next while they were, they weren't ready with Scribble Knots yet. They weren't right. ready to show it. And they said, we want to make something else. And I said to Jeremiah, the lead designer there, I said, Jeremiah, let me introduce you to my f- one of my favorite games of all time, The Horde. Oh, okay. And The Horde was this game. It's a, it was a real it's early a tower, defense. tower defense game. And in it, you would build structure. You would tend to farm in The Horde. Yeah. And I said, why don't we do this? But instead of tending a farm, we build stuff. And that's where Box okay. West came from. Yeah, so... Um, this game is a DS game. It's really good, actually. It's, it's, yeah, it's a yeah. really good game. I think they I, just like reissued it. it on Steam or I mean on Twitch or something. Or? Um, so when THQ went under, uh, a, a, a company that ended up being called THQ Nordic right. uh, has the rights. They've just recently re-released it, I think, on mobile. Oh, was it on mobile? I, I thought it was on, on Twitch. Oh, maybe it's on Twitch. Yeah. Or I'm not, not sure. Twitch. Or Steam. Uh, Switch. Switch. They gotta stop naming all these things too similarly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody I, could look I, it up. I think it's on Switch. But uh, anyway. Yeah. So you're you you play as a character. Your character can run around in this isometric uh, world. He has a big can, wrench. And uh, there were there were creeps who would come in, and you could build towers, and you and they uh, they would they would attack the creeps, and the creeps would attack the towers. You could run around. You could fix the towers. You could hit the creeps yourself, but you're not as good at do, at doing this as the as the towers are, and you could die. Yeah. Um, yeah, it turned out great. Yeah, yeah I liked no, it. All. It worked out, and it had this this fairly deep, uh, very very anime inspired story to it. Uh, Not as depressing an ending as Drawn to Life, though, where no. like everybody dies in a car wreck or something. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> all right, so you so you uh, parted ways with THQ. Well, because the regime changed. Well, part well THQ was went went under. Um, uh, but you left before it went under. Um, 
just a little bit. It didn't go under until like 2012 or something. Uh, yeah, fo- formally and fully. Right, okay. Um, but I mean, it was... <laughs> you it, saw the water rising. The, uh, the, the economy collapsed in 2008. Right. THQ was, a, was, the size of THQ was, and I've kind of felt bad for the... Oh, uh, they lost like a ton of developers. They had ton of, lost a ton of developers. Yeah. They didn't have, they were the wrong size company to be able to withstand the kind of economic collapse that we actually had yeah. in this country. They weren't big enough and they weren't small enough. They weren't big enough and they weren't small enough. They weren't small enough just to like coast along and survive. Um, and they weren't big enough to have enough of, of their own money stockpiled to not have to... Uh, take loans from the bank to keep a lot of companies of this size. The way that they work is that they just run on credit. They just like they they borrow money and pay it off and keep borrowing and keep paying it off and keep borrowing and keep paying it off. Two thousand eight happens. The banks are no longer lending money. THQ starts to really, really, really suffer. Yeah. Um, and I was downsized. Oh, out of all that. That's right. You were. Sorry. No, oh, I. I know. It wasn't my fault. So. <laughs> it wasn't my fault either. But you, So you went to a company with a better credit rating, which yeah, was I Disney. Did. So, well, I didn't even go to Disney. Oh. I started, I started, this is when I started my own business. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So I started my own company, uh, basically just doing freelance game design. And uh, I'm happily still just doing freelance game design. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. It's been 10 years? Uh, yeah, 11 now. 11, yeah. Awesome. Yep. There you go, Andy Ashcraft, yeah. indie game designer. That's right, and uh, and as a result, I ended up going and working at, at Disney Mobile um, for a hand like a couple like a, a big project. There was a, a project called uh, Pixar's Cars, two. Disney's Pixar's Cars Two App tar, Cars Two App Mates. Right, it's, a, the, it's a mouthful with M A T capitalized. Uh, yes, because um, so it's really App Mat. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was something. It was. It was. It was a title really designed to appeal to uh, our target audience, which was four-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> they should have just called it Vroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, this project it was a. It was an iPad game, and the idea was, uh, we. The, the, uh, one of my coworkers had developed this this way of building a toy. You could set down on the iPad screen, and it would become a controller. So the toy itself would con- you could you could so basically a toy car. Set it down on the screen. It would transfer your touch down through the bottom of the toy car, and the toy car you could drive around. So we basically built out Radiator Springs as this. You've seen uh, you guys have seen uh, the rugs that go in kids' rooms with like the the, the tracks and the ra- and the streets and stuff on that. We basically built Radiator Springs as a big version of that. And your iPad screen would show you this much of it at any given time, scaled to the size of the car, the toy car. And as you drove, it would just sort of it would just drive around. You could drive anywhere you wanted around Radiator Springs. That was really cool. And it was great. Um, it was super cool. Uh, we got some very nice compliments from from a variety of pe- a variety of people. A lot of adults loved it. Um, uh, uh, the kids, so. They, the four-year-old kids who were playing with this game were like, yeah, the car goes room and the, and the lights turns on and all that. That's what it does in my head anyway. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a slight mismatch. In the, <laughs> like, so maybe that's the why they really called got it. The, like the magic of this game, this, ma- this magical experience was totally lost on the four-year-olds because that's what's going on in their imagination already. Yeah. So that's why they called it Pixar's Disney's Cars 2 app mates because that appeals to an older audience. I guess uh, um, it was also it also came out the same Christmas that um, Skylanders yeah. came out, oh. and uh, with, but without the but without the marketing, right? And so uh, you could go into Toys R Us and you could go to where they sold um, iPad cases, and you could find our game there. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad because it was a nice product. It was yeah, really yeah, no, a cool. It was a really, thing. it was a really interesting product. Um, uh, I was very, I, again, very happy with the way it came out. Yeah, no, um, it, was, it was good. Yeah. yeah. So there was another game that you did for Disney, and that was Mickey's Magical Maths World. Yes. So, what advice do you have for somebody working on an educational game? Because this is very clearly oh, yeah. an educational game. Right. Well. 
uh, so they this it was it was being made by by the wing of the company that makes educational products. So made by the same people that write all their like their their books for kids and, and stuff. So they they know what they're doing in regards to what sort of content they need in the game. Um, the, 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 the real, um, my real challenge in that project wasn't so much like figuring out how to make gameplay that taught these things because there were, there were just, there were mini games basically, just a variety of mini games that the characters played. Mickey games. Mi yes, Mickey and mini games <laughs> and some Donald games and right. even a Daisy game. Oh, wow, Daisy, uh -huh. getting some love. Yeah, we had the whole we had the whole group there. Fab Five. Yep. Uh, the real the real challenge there, as with any games with with Disney, as you know, is um, you when you're writing those characters, you're writing stuff for those characters to do. They're very 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 particular, especially about the Fab Five, about exactly what these characters can and cannot do, what they can and cannot say. So very little swearing. Very little swearing. <laughs> they also, and this is interesting, Mickey and Minnie and the, the Fab Five, they, never, they, they will never acknowledge that they are in a game. They can't talk to you about the game. They can't tell you how to play the game because they're not in a game. They're in their world. They're delusional. <laughs> <laughs> and so... You have to, if you, if you need to have somebody tell you how to play the game, it can't be any of those characters. So who told them? Just, there just has to be some sort of other narrator. Who was it? Uh, we had a robot. Oh. It, was, uh, it was set on a space station. It was, uh, uh, there was, it was science fiction-y sort of themed, and it was basically math games for, again, four to five-year-olds. Right. In uh, space? In space. Okay. Um, so they were, like, building rockets and building robots and... and uh, were they blasting math? They were not <laughs> blasting math. <laughs> uh, uh, but that was a uh, uh, that was that was a, basically a new development team over there, one that hadn't really been put together for very long, and they were uh, their their executives had had oversold what they could do. Brand new development team. Uh, and a large part of my job there, honestly, and I didn't realize it going in, but what, it, what ended up being, my, I think, my most useful contribution to the team was talking some of these people out off of the ledge because they were getting so stressed. Uh -huh. And they just didn't, and they were new, and a lot of them were brand new to game design at all. And a lot of the artists, particularly the artists, were, were people pulled from all kinds of different other Disney projects. Right. Um, this was all done in, in Disney consumer products. And they had just finished building that big six-story building, so there were a lot of ledges to be talked and off of. And there were a lot of ledges to be talked off of, and they were so stressed. And I'm like, look, you're, nobody's going to ship this game unless it's done. Yeah. And if it's, and if, and, and most importantly, art never makes games late. <laughs> it's always programming. Yeah. The, the, a game will never be late because of the, art, the art didn't get done. The game was always going to be late because the programming didn't get done. And that's honestly just a, a, a production problem. Right, but the game doesn't get done if programming doesn't get done. So. Right, so. There you go, the circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> so all these artists, I, I hopefully was able to, to let them sleep at night a little bit. Right, so it was also around this time-ish that you got into teaching. That's right, yeah, a few years later, um, I got a call from Chris Swain, who runs the department here, uh, who, uh, who had uh, seen me or maybe heard heard about me teaching um, the game design workshop courses, uh, being part of the team that teaches the game design workshop courses at at the at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, up in San Francisco, and uh, pinged me and asked me if I wanted to to work here. And you said no. And I said initially, yes, but, and he said, no buts. I'm hiring Scott. <laughs> Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah. You're the one who told me about the job. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I basically pointed him to you. I, we, he and I couldn't, like, we couldn't make it work for the first, the first <laughs> semester. 
I did not know that. <laughs> I thought you were already working there, and then you said they need more people, so hey, why don't you talk to Scott? No, no, no. Oh, so, oh, yeah, and oh. so you ended up working here first, oh. and then I came on a, a, right. a semester or two later. Well, there you go, I've got seniority. Yeah. Excellent, and I'm reaping the benefits. That's right. <laughs> you, you get to sit on that side. I get to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm on this side with the piece of paper, yes. Uh, so um, why should somebody get a degree in game design? Uh, why, why shouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, why shouldn't they? But, well, it's sort but of, what it's, is it? It's what? sort of interesting, right? Um, we, uh, these game design degrees are not very old. Uh, they didn't exist when we were in school. No. Uh, the, the idea of them hadn't even started really existing. Maybe like, the mid-2000s. Yeah. So, yeah. um, uh, so it's very interesting to be on the first, like, I sort of feel like we're in the first line of people ever teaching these things. Maybe the second. Maybe. I kind of chalk up Chris's generation as the first. Yeah, but Him and like Zimmerman a, and Tracy. But they were like, and, like, what are they, they, they're like three years ahead of us. Well, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. At least we know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, He never it's, watches these things anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. He's, uh, 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 so it's sort of interesting to like, 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 well, how do you, how do, I, I, it's interesting to me in a design, like, it feels like game design, honestly. Does, uh, teaching people how teaching to make Teaching people game how to make design. games yeah. feels like game design to yeah. me because it was, it's really not that dissimilar than when you're working with a group of developers trying to make a game. Right, that's true. Like, it's a slightly different out, output, right? Right. Like uh, we're going to make a bunch of little games, and instead of instead of we're all get, working together to make one game, or in some cases you are working together to make one game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it really doesn't feel that different to me. Uh, I'd say that's fair. Uh, and it, so I was also coming in, I like that first semester. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have these people like staring at me for three hours at a time. Only an hour and a half. No, no, not here. <laughs> not in, in class, in our in our classes, like place central yeah, design. Yeah, yeah. These students are going to come in here and they're going to be staring at me for like three hours twice a week. What am I going to do? What am I going to do to to fill that time? And then, at like the very first day, the very first class I taught, I'm like, oh, this is like running a D and D game. <laughs> this is exactly like running a D and D game. All I have to do is keep people pointed in the right direction, and it'll just happen. Right. Uh, you didn't assign roles. You're the cleric. You're no, the druid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about that. You're the barbarian. <laughs> yeah. Make them wear hats. All right. Uh, so uh, what advice do you have for somebody who might be interested in teaching game design then? Other than running it like a D&D campaign. Oh, right, right. Uh, um, uh, well, teaching anything, you want to make sure that you you know... The subject? The subject, yeah. <laughs> like, if you've got anybody who's ever, like tried to give a talk about something that they're like not fully prepare, prepared for, uh, you'll know that like you reach the end of like your knowledge and you know exactly where that cliff is. You're like, I'm going over this cliff right now. And that's what YouTube videos are for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so definitely make sure that you, you, you know the stuff. Uh, it is, it's very useful, of course, to have the experience that we've had. Yeah. To be able to come in and talk about those things, and like, and uh, uh, living fossils of the history of game design. Yeah, and just the, <laughs> the just the experience of like like working with groups of people to make a thing happen. Right. Um, that's something that if any of you guys have an opportunity to do, then you guys will. And this is the way we divide, we design the the course load the way that we do is so that you have all these opportunities to get together. And, and work together and make things happen because that's ultimately all you're doing, whether it's game design, whether it's you know, any other sort of group, group activity. Yeah. So in addition to your teaching, you have written some articles for the blog, the NIFA blog. Yes. And one of them that I particularly like is your article on game literacy in which you say that uh, game designers should view life as a game. What do you mean by that and why is it important for people to do that? Um, uh, life is a game um, because your challenges are the kind of the same and if you just if you realize that they're kind of challenges in the same way that game challengers are game challenges 
then it kind of frees you up to maybe approach them in a different way, in a way that doesn't like crush your spirit. Uh, uh, it's, it's just a it's a, it's a it's a way of like looking at games as or a way of looking at life in a different perspective, which actually brings me to another another topic that I had wanted to talk about too, right. which is it's cool to like look at different things from the, as a point of view from the, as if they're games. Uh, but I, there's a limit to that, and I've come to, and I've come to the limit to it, of it, and, uh, and that has, has to do with um, how we talk about, so we talk about, we can use game-like language when we talk about different things, uh, like all kinds of different things that we go through in, 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 in life, and we can sort of like pull back and talk about, it's like, well, if, if this is a game, what would somebody, like, we're in a role-playing game, uh, we're having this, this, maybe we're having some sort of uh, conflict, um, uh, if we're in a role-playing game, how would we handle this? If we're in a, a worker placement game, how does this how does this work as a worker placement game? Uh, you can sort of get a different perspective on it. Um, uh, I've come to realize that the way that our elections are talked about in the media is peppered with game talk. We use all this game metaphor, and particularly uh, when when we're Blues. when we're cover in the coverage of of elections and the way people talk about elections, the way, the way newscasters talk about elections. Uh, you know, it's a race. People are running a race. They're winning an election. Uh, I've come to realize that this is wholly inappropriate. Uh, don't mix your games in politics, is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is don't talk about politics as if it's a game. Right, because uh, it's too important. It's too important. First off, it's too important to take lightly, straight up. Uh, but secondly, the, the worst part about it is it actually undermines democracy. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, I'll lead you through this. Uh, this is, I've just sort of recently come to this realization. You've had a theory. I, I, I have, I've had an epiphany. Huh. Is that why your hair went purple? Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when, uh, so, Let's tr- so and and I've heard I've heard there's other media critics out here. I'm not the first person to make to, to have this criticism that we shouldn't talk about uh, our politics as as if we're talking about horse races, and we and we tend to we tend to talk about it as a, as if it's a horse race. Um, and the reason that it's bad for our democracy is this: when you are the audience of a horse race, what what is your agency? So agency talking about game design. Uh, agency is your ability to do stuff, right? Your ability to actually make things happen in a game is your agency in the game. Or in life, your agency in life is your ability to, to actually make decisions and make meaningful decisions about, about what's happening around you. When you're at a horse race and you're the audience of a horse race, what, are, what is your agency? It's not, you, other than betting. You can bet on right. the winner. Right, you can guess what the winner is. You can guess as who's, who the winner is going to be. But that's not how voting works. But that's not how voting works, except if you talk about it this way, that's how voting will be taken. Because people think that they have no agency when in reality they do. Thank Bingo. you. Bingo. Hey, I went to, it's almost like I went to game design school or something. <laughs> right, so to, to underline this point, when, when we talk about our elections as if they're horse races and we sort of build this idea and the way that we think about them, the way we talk about elections, instead of it being a decision that we're making as a group, we're making group decision, Instead, we're talking about it as, well, which one of us is going to win? We're, right, we're right, opponents right. in an election. Which one of us is going to win? Right. And, so. and when in reality, it's better for more people to win than to lose, right? Like even the fact that, it's, that we already separated out, you know, let's just for a second say there's just two, right? There's two teams. Sure. One is going to win. One is going to lose. Right. But it doesn't. Well, well, hold on. You're already talking about it in terms of games. Winning and losing. Right, right. Those are game terms. No, no, no. That's what I'm saying, that people are yeah, using yeah. this terminology, right? Yeah, yeah. But the But the irony is the game, the goal of the game is not that one team wins and one team loses because we're all part of the same team. It should be like Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Where everybody works together for a, a goal. Now, some right. people might fail yeah. their saving throws and, and get killed or, by or a... Or it's a, it's a, a game a, development team. Owl bear or something. It's, but. it's a game development team. Trying to figure out what they're right. what what kind of game they're going to make. Right. Some people want to make one kind of game. Some people want to make a different kind of game. And so, what do you do? You ultimately have to make a decision. Right. How do you make that decision? Um, you compromise. You compromise. Yeah. You but 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 more importantly, you don't think about it as a game. You don't think about the decision of making a game 
as a game. Well, you've been in enough situations where I mean, you might flip a coin or something like that. If, like, if you need if you need a random element to it, right? But, but, but I'm sure that if you're like me, you've been in a situation where there have been failures of the of the management when you're working on a game. Sure. And so, and and usually, what happens in that situation is the team kind of gets together in in absentia of the management and goes, "Look, we all believe in this game. Let's just get it done." <laughs> right. Yes, let's let's yes, make yes, this yes. game despite our bad management. Sure. Right. And so they're working for this common goal. Right. To make this good thing that they will, you know, and then they hope that it does well and and they can keep making more of these things. Right. I mean, that's really the goal of a of a game creator. Right. Is that we've been, I don't know if luck is the right word, but but we have been uh, fortunate enough to be able to keep working. Uh, over many years, right? We have yeah. you know, pretty long careers in creating games, and it's and part of it is because we're maybe we're stubborn and we don't give up. But part of it is that maybe we know what we're talking about. But part of it is we've managed to parlay our experience into better experiences, right? Right. Yeah. And hopefully build up build better experiences for other people right. too. Yeah. Exactly. And create better workplaces for other people through our, uh, the same experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Because right? I, and I, and I think this is important to teach. When you're designing a game, you're not only designing the game, but you're designing the process of designing the game. Right. And you're designing the process of making the game usually at the same time. With hopefully the hope of re- being able to repeat it. Yes. But not get in the situation that 2K is in where they're a slave to that system. Right. Happy slaves, by the way. Happy, rich slaves. <laughs> <laughs> yes, happy, rich slaves, yes. Well, you know. um, speaking of uh, uh, a way to get rich, you have been recently making board games. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Again, me chasing the pennies on the dollar. Right. So you made The Siblings Trouble, yep, which uh, is... So I worked with a, a friend of mine named uh, Ed Baroff. He worked on, met with uh, World of Zoo. Yeah. Right. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, no, he he worked at the same company. I got him. I got him that job at that company. Oh, okay. But I he thought... was actually working on the other project. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, so this is a board game that pe- or a tabletop game that people can buy. That's right. It's a tabletop game that people can buy. And what's uh, it about? It is. Uh, you're playing. It's a it's a very light role playing game. Uh, you are playing as as brothers and sisters in a family. There, and you're going off on adventures out of your backyard. And adventures can take uh, strange sort of mystical twists. Uh, it's very, it kind of, it, it gets into sort of um, kids on bikes territory. It's like Fantasy Goonies Fantasy or Goonies Stand By Me. Stuff like or, that, right? Yeah. But it's a card-based game, so you basically create a, you build a deck, an adventure deck of cards, and then you just take turns revealing the next card and then telling, and, and telling the story about what happens. So it's a GM-less game. Uh, each player narrates the, the next card down in the stack. And there's some very simple uh, like combat mechanics and, and things and, and collection mechanics to it. Yeah, cool. Uh, some cool mechanics. And you tell a little story. And uh, it takes about half an hour, 45 minutes to play. Right. And then you're working on kind of your magnum opus right now. Yes. My current magnum opus is very close to being done. It's a time travel. Uh, the holy grail of board game design. That's right. Time travel. Time travel. It's a, it's a game where you're, it's an empire building, uh, worker placement, Area control, time travel game. Uh, it's epic. <laughs> it's got time traveling and little aliens that get in your way. That's right. And yeah, so it's it's your your empires in a in a far flung future. Um, uh, you've been as empires, you've been fighting with one another and and trading with one another and doing all this stuff with one another and 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 then the aliens came and wiped it all out. But the good news is you've just developed time travel. Congratulations. And you can now go back in time to set it all right and put yourself at the top. Of the food chain. Of, the, of, of two. Of the empire. Alien and... Of, well, no. Um, there's, oh, that's right. The, the different empires. empires. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Right. It's a competitive game. So right. That's true. You want to put yourself as the as as strongest empire at the end of the game. Maybe you should make the meeples out of like candy so you can't oh, eat the... Edible enemies. Edible people. I've always... I've always I used to use in, in my D&D days, I would use the little Hershey's chocolates as edible enemies. So you can say, all right, here's... Here's a bunch of orcs. And eat them. Go like, eat them. And then everybody would fight over which one, who got to kill the the, the special darks because <laughs> the kill steal for the special dark is way better than kill stealing for the you know Mr. Goodbar. Right. Uh, <laughs> so in addition to time travel, your other game you're working on is time related. 
and that's the Hero Instance, the Hero Instance which is a like totally different type of game. Superhero role playing game. Yep. Some of you have played it. Yeah, uh, I have. Uh, he has. Uh, it actually, ha I've just recently added time travel to it. Oh, okay. So you can actually play now a time traveling superhero. Nice. Uh, with because it has a time a, a specific time tracking mechanic that's different from other role playing games. So you're obsessed with time right now. I'm kind of on a time kick. I just read a great book called. Um, uh, that's <laughs> obviously uh, a great it was, book. It's a. It's called the the. It's, it was, it's not the, the short history of time. It's not... It's a not, long history of time. It is, yeah, it's not... It, it's not we'll it's put Stephen, it in the show it's not, notes. It's not Stephen Hawking's book. It's, uh, it's another uh, 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 physicist, um, an Italian physicist, uh, talking about time, and it was, it's, it's awesome. Okay. Yeah, I'll put it in the, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. Right. I'll bring it to my classes. Awesome. So, um, so we want to give people some time to ask you some questions. Sure. But before we get to that... Um, uh, what is next for Andy Ashcraft? Well, so um, this time travel game, uh, what's great about working on a time travel game is that when it's finished, it'll feel like it took no time at all because uh, it's, it's taken me about four years to work on it. Right. Uh, and so I have a backlog of other, of other game ideas that I need to get out of my head now. And most of them are much shorter, much smaller more compact games. And so. now that you have a time machine, you can go back in time. And exactly. You're, by this time, by this time tomorrow, they'll all be done. <laughs> and uh, you'll be rich. <laughs> and I'll be rich from all that board game money. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Excellent. Thank you for answering my questions. But now I know a little bit more about you, which is actually... Oh. You know, strange, because I thought I knew everything about you. Right, you listen to my wife's podcast. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> she, His wife has a podcast. I'm wearing the shirt from it. It's very good. It's called The Dork Forest. You should listen to it. All right, so now let's... I'm sure you guys have some questions for Andy, so why don't you guys... The microphone is right, right, there. right there. Please go and ask him anything, except for, uh, will you make my game? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been in your class for, like, what, two semesters now? I can't give you a super hardball. That's true. <laughs> Great. Um, this might be a little on the fence, though. So, um, you in the history, it seems like you've had a couple flops. What are things that you can oh. learn? <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say, Michael? <laughs> uh, how do you learn or take uh, the good? Basically, how do you deconstruct your flops and take what you learned from them, take the good and the bad, and figure out which is which? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. How do you, basically, how, how do you, especially, it's particularly hard to do immediately afterwards. Mm -hmm. But time cures these things. So again, time travel is awesome. <laughs> um, so, you know, when, I, when, when Return to Crondor came out, I was super excited about it. Um, but it was really hard for me to, to read negative reviews. Uh, but, you know, a year later, you're now in the midst of something else. You can go back and read those negative reviews, and it's not so, and it doesn't hurt you quite so much right here. And you can go, oh, oh yeah, yeah. All right, now I'll, I'll, and so you just make note. You just like, like, oh yeah, I won't do that again. Uh, 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 or I'll Hope. try not to do that. Yeah, again. hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. I remember. So yeah, so it's 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 more about like giving it for some perspective. Um, giving it time allows you to get a, get a, a different perspective on it. You can start to look at games that you made as maybe things that are not just you on your shoulders, um, and so you can see the you can more more easily see the things that you could have done better. Um, uh, I, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank okay. you. So, of all the things you've of every game that you've designed and or that you've worked on. Uh, what experience? Um, what like? What's your favorite experience of like where you maybe took uh, took a lot of time? You designed a mechanic or a feature, and it just came together really, really well. And you're just like, wow, that was really, really clever. Like, what, what, what? I'm looking for a story. Like, what's? Uh, yeah, what, have what, you so, made anything clever? <laughs> 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 so, um, so I can tell you a, a couple. Of, I can tell you an early story and a late story on that. Um, the, the best feeling, by the way, if you're leading a team of people, literally the best feeling is when you, you, you send somebody off with an idea and they come back to you and it's way better than you could possibly imagine it. 
Yeah. That's the best feeling in the world. Um, and so that happened early on with the, uh, we were having a hard time getting the look of that, that, that Korean Firewolves uh, game right. And it was like, it was, it was too cartoony or it was too this or too that. And we finally ended up with this, we found this look um, that was sort of smoky and strange and, and, uh, and allowed for things to be kind of cartoony, but at the same time kind of, kind of scary at the same time. And we're like, ah, yes, we're there. And I remember running around the office, just showing it to everyone, like showing this, <laughs> this, this one piece of, of art that somebody had made. And I'm like, this is it, this is it, we found it. Uh, I remember running around showing it to everybody. People who weren't even on the team, people like, you know, accountants are like, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then more recently, uh, I just Tuesday night ran a blind test for my time travel game. So blind tests are, are terrifying events where you hand somebody the box with the rules and you sit down and you don't say anything and you watch them try to figure out how to play your game. Uh, and there are moments in the game and there are moments when, the, when it happened when somebody, they, they like, they're reading through the rules and they're trying to figure out, it's a fairly, it's a fairly complex game. Uh, I'll drop something. Oh. Um, uh, it's a fairly complex game, but they make a connection like, oh, I see how this works. And then they're like, oh, that's really cool. And they have that moment of like, oh, I see how this actually fits the theme. I see how this, this mechanic fits the theme. And that's, that was a, that's, a, that's a nice feeling too. Does that answer your question, sir? All right. Um, sorry, I just forgot the name of two games that you mentioned earlier. Uh-huh. Uh, what was the name of the first one, which was supposed to be like a match to... I don't know, kill Mario, like actually. Oh, uh, that was called the Floygan Brothers. Uh, oh, F L O I G A N Bros, B R O S. And it was for it was for Dreamcast. Okay. It was only on Dreamcast, right? It was only on Dreamcast. And the second game that I can't remember the name of was the way you described it was a game where you ran around and fixed buildings, I think. Oh, um, uh, War of the Monsters, where we no, were no. your giant monsters smashing stuff. No, Lock's no, no, Quest. it was like oh, oh, Lock's Quest, right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah uh, L O C K apostrophe apostrophe S, S Quest. Simple yep. enough. They're both good games. Yeah, and Lock's Quest you can is available now on some other platform that it wasn't <laughs> on before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steam. Okay. Okay, great. All right. Two questions in one, but sure. I'm sure you would have answered uh, the second question within the first question. I'll let him answer half of it. <laughs> anyway, so what was your favorite D&D &D character that you created and why? Ah, uh, um, so, okay. Um, I think uh, I've, there's been so many, so many. Um, as a player or as a GM making NPCs? Hmm. I was really thinking player, but I mean, if you have one that you enjoyed more as a DM. Just... Okay. Um, I think I tend to like the play, the characters that I'm playing right now more than the characters I played last year. Um, but uh, I, um, I kind of have a silly streak when it comes to naming characters now. So uh, my favorite recent character was a... Uh, Paladin, a fifth edition D and D game. Uh, she was a dragonborn paladin uh, named Sister Irma Gerd. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and so and then the other one on the GM side. Um, okay, so this was really fun. Um, it was a total throwaway thing. It ended up being a big deal in this, in this campaign that I've been running for a long time. And that is, uh, early on in the game, the heroes came across as sort of a basic, you know, they're out in the wilderness, random encounter. They came across these talking rats who were willing to trade gold for silver. The rats wanted silver. They were willing to trade gold that they had found for silver. Uh, and the party, of course, was on board. <laughs> They're like, how can we get more? Where can we find you when we get more gold? Or when we get more silver to give you for your gold? And, and so they ended up being like a, a they, they, they'd reappear periodically. They'd find more of these rats, and these rats always wanted more silver. Um, 
And they finally got to figure out what the rats wanted to do with it. And the rats were trying to get to the moon. And they were building basically this, this big silver sphere that would take them <laughs> to the moon. Uh, uh, and so it was kind of a cool reveal at the end that uh, after, after all this after all these little silly little uh, like trade encounters with these rats, that the rats actually had something that they were doing with it. So that was super fun. All right. And why were they going to the moon? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. No, no, because it was made of silver. Oh, the moon's made of silver? <laughs> oh, okay. So they're making a moon to go to the moon? Yeah. All right. All right. Who am I to argue with a rat? <laughs> hey Andy, uh, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, really that's the least I can it. do, and I always oh. do the least I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough government work. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, I'm actually a person who's coming from is in the entertainment industry, and I'm transitioning to what I should have done when I was a kid and didn't get a lot of support from my parents. Regardless, um, part of an aspect that stood out to me as um, an element of your discussion today was you kind of got a foot in the door by knowing somebody not necessarily directly but you kind of got that yeah and i think for a lot of us in the entertainment industry industries in general a lot of times it ends up being you have to know people so my question is yeah do you have a suggestion of how to meet people in the industry um these sort of events are really the best way to do it um uh also just making things so there's a there's a huge like if you're interested in, in game design and hopefully you all are um there's a big community here in the valley of people who make board games, and you can make board games on your own. You don't need a team of, of developers to do this. You can just do this. And there's, there's a big community of, of, develop, of game designers here in the valley who get together and we play each other's prototypes. And those, those connections will end up like adding more breadth to your, to your network of people who are also working in these industries. And they're not, all, they're not always just get, like, like frequently, if it's particularly in board games, these are people who have other jobs and other aspects. So um, we know people who are editors, movie, movie editors, but are make board games on the sides. And so we know, we know writers who make board games on the sides. We know, we know all these different kinds of people because, because, of our, because we share our board games together. And, and same for video games. There's plenty of, I mean, many of you in the audience are members of meetups and other yeah. organizations of indie game developers. I, IGDA is, yeah. a, is a good yeah. place to go for, for the video game stuff. And we also have our Make and Mingle and once a month where game developers come that's and meet right. each other. And that's where a few of you have, you know, found out about us. So, yes, please come to more of our events and meet the people there. And, and but also... Um, explore you know what else there's a the, la is a very vibrant game development community it's one of the bigger um cities in the u.s for game development and yeah. so you're in the right place you just gotta make sure you introduce yourself yeah what, what sort of people are you trying to find well so i'm actually looking to be a cinematic like designer do, do, i'm c coming from film okay so that's what i'm coming from so i want to do translate a lot of i have a bachelor's degree and i've been doing it for 10 years yeah so i'm changing industries which is difficult so i'm looking to i mean i'm actively applying to gaming companies now trying to just get a foot in the door oh, while right. i'm teaching myself unreal engine trying to translate that and it's difficult coming from an industry and people are like well you don't really like what do you what do you bring to the table what does this translate Right. So just kind of curious, like, obviously I know how to meet film people because I've come from that industry and it's pretty easy to meet film people. Right. But um, it's, it's pretty clear what, what you will bring to the table that, that, that maybe people who, who've come, who have art degrees you know, and are, are, are just building, building sets and, and action and all that is you, you know how to frame things. You'll, you'll, know, yeah. how to, you'll know how to stream it together from, from shot to shot. Right. You'll, you'll have these sort of, that, that's where you're going to, that's the, your experience that you're going to bring. Good deal. So make something that shows that off. Yeah, I mean, so right now I'm just trying to find a opportunity to just get in. First of all, don't don't uh, wait for them to invite you to the party. Right. Make your own party. All right. Good deal. Thanks very much. Yeah. Good luck. Parties like the meet and mingle every month. <laughs> <laughs> and I made that. Uh, yeah. So at the um, kind of closer to the end of the discussion that you guys had. Um, I think uh, you mentioned something about starting your own game company. Yeah. And uh, sticking with it for like 10 years up until yeah. today or so. So I, I, oh, I, yeah. I should point out that it's, it's not a game company in the sense that it's, it's, I don't make games for myself, except for the board games and stuff. 
Um, I'm a, it's basically a consultancy. I, I myself and sometimes I hire younger designers to work with me um, as as game design consultants for other people's games. I see. How would you uh, describe your experience running this company, and maybe like what are some of the bigger challenges? What what were some of the best stuff you got out of it? That kind of a thing. Yeah, um, that's good. Um, so the uh, uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is that unlike a traditional job, uh, I don't necessarily know what my next job is going to be. Um, I've currently got. Uh, two clients. Um, one is sort of on this sort of slow burn, uh, where I, I, uh, I'm sort of uh, there when they need me, but I don't have to do a whole lot. And and then another one is the board is, is on this board game on the Time Empire. And uh, and so there's there's these moments where you're like, oh, I don't have any clients. I wonder if I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if this is. I wonder if I, this is the end of my. Of my career, but there never is. It never is. There's always something else that, that'll that'll pop up sooner or later. Uh, the 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 so the, the the challenge there is sort of like just mental fortitude of being able to just like don't sweat it. It's all going to be fine. There's going to be another five hundred dollars in my world somewhere. <laughs> It'll be fine. Um, the other uh, and then the other aspect of it, which is what's great about it, is um, I. I didn't realize this because I'd worked at I'd worked steadily as a as a full time employee from the time that I got in in 1994 to the time that uh, that THQ basically let me go in 2009. So about 15 years I was I was a full time employee somewhere, and I didn't realize how much stress I was holding being a full time employee. <laughs> uh, that there is always this like, oh my God, what happens if they let me go? All right, that when I was now working for myself is freeing. Uh, and, I've, and weirdly, that, and this is, a, this is another thing, and this is just sort of about the industry in general. Those of you who are sort of a, a familiar with the way that the film industry runs, it's really, it was shocking to me. It was shocking to me early in my career that everybody wanted to hire me full time. <laughs> like I fully expected this gig to be gig based. I expected it to be freelance. I don't I couldn't understand why they would keep designers around after the game was in production. And it makes a little bit of sense and there's and part of it is that they that the industry is really based on programming. So programmers are the most important people in the industry. They do the most important work. You can't have computer games without programmers. So clearly, they're they're you know. And so the way that that employers handle programmers is that you want to keep that you want to keep that technical knowledge. You want to keep that that uh, that institutional knowledge close. And so they just treat everybody the same way as they treat their programmers. So the the just as a general sort of sense, when you're in the in the video game industry. Everybody's sort of treated the same way that they treat their programmers, which is treat it all. But it never made sense to me at all that that was the way that they would treat the creative people like us. Uh, that that, well, that would make more sense to do it as production to production to production like they do in film. They, they treat them the same except for when it comes to pay. Well, and except for when it is fi finally, when it is, when, when you do have a, some sort of downturn, the designers are the first ones to. That is true. Because <laughs> anybody can design a game. Because anybody, everybody knows how to design games, right. right? It's like writing a screenplay. Everybody knows how to write a screenplay, right? right? So, did I answer your question or did I sort of get yeah, sidetracked? Yeah, thank you. No, okay, no, good. Thank you. Who else has another question? Oh, this guy does. Hey, um, so I just wanted to start off with echoing your point about uh, making stuff and putting it out there because uh, I think I've done that and I've got really good opportunities because of uh, making some something yeah. that I just liked and nobody else cared about it and I just put it on, I'm a programmer, so I put it on GitHub and yeah, I awesome. got really good opportunities because of that. That's great. So yeah, so oh, I just by the want... Way, game designers, he's a programmer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, I don't know what platform exists for game designers, but yeah, for us it was GitHub. Yeah, but, GitHub works. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, my class? my question about uh, my question is about uh, I want you to talk a little bit more about AI because that's where I come from, and sure. where uh, where does it stand in the game industry? And I really like you mentioned uh, like when you mentioned about the Floygen Brothers and the way the AI was designed in it. Yeah, what we in our field call that sort of an AI is general AI, so artificial general intelligence. Yeah is uh, what the, what's that about. But I think a lot of the other games just focus on if this, do this sort of an AI, which is like the regular AI. Right. So I don't know what the direction uh, the industry is taking uh, in, in that aspect. So I, I, can, I, can make a, I can make a fairly educated guess. Um, uh, I haven't worked on a project that really has a, a strong AI component for a long while. Um, so I can only really guess at this. But my guess is that the... Um, uh, that the computing power that is available now has gotten to the point where we, and it was for a long time, the computing power was really focused on rendering, like rendering a sharper image, rendering more detail in an image, all that. We can now render more detail than the eye can see. So what's the, but, but computer power, computer power and computer, oh, am I, did I, did I lose my, uh, uh, Computer power is still increasing at the same rate. And so I think that what will happen, what we'll see is more characters on screen doing stuff. We'll see more AIs happening at the, at the same time. So, and I'm beginning to see that already in the, in the, in the, even in the mobile games that, that, that we see. I see. I see mobile games that are basically uh, uh, tower defense games where instead of it's like a single line of things sort of trudging forward, it's waves of stuff coming down. And you know each one of those is some sort of little object-oriented AI. Mm -hmm. And it's probably a very simple AI. It's just like run towards this thing and do damage. Yeah. But they pro it, the computing power is, is such that I think that what we're going to see is we're going to see them devoting that extra computing power, don't have to do, use it for rendering anymore, to making things look smarter. Is that? Yeah, uh, but also in addition, uh, where do you think the real potential lies uh, for AI in games? Oh, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, uh, the sky's the limit, really. Um, we, when we talk about AI, we tend to think about characters making decisions, right? But maybe that's not what your AI is doing. Maybe your AI is doing something, something much more fundamental, like figuring out where your camera is or figuring out um, what the economy needs to charge. You know, like maybe there's some sort of, some sort of like uh, real-time fluctuations in, econ in, in, in economy in some sort of economy game, like an EVE Online sort of game where like the AI is actually like managing the economy you know, AIs can do vastly more complicated things than would even necessarily be visible to the player. Right. Yeah. I, I think also it might even go in the direction of, I don't know what the term, if there is a term for this, but in what I would call an outward looking AI, kind of like what they used to do in um, all the Naughty Dog games, which was it would look at what the player's status was and how they're playing the game and craft the experience towards that user. So if you are, uh, you know, like, yeah. like yeah. the real early you think example is in Crash Bandicoot, where uh, if you were low on health and you broke a chest, it would give you health. But if you were at a certain, if you were a certain percentage of health, you'd break it, you get a fruit. But then if you, uh, depending on how many fruits you had gotten recently, you might break it and get the mask instead. And so it was constantly polling the user and saying, what does the user want? What is, kind of, a little bit like the director in uh, Left 4 Dead, right? Like yeah. the director looks at the experience and kind of gauges what's going on in the game and says, what's the status of the game? And is thing are things too easy for the player? Are they yeah, too hard? Or is the player doing a certain amount of things over and over again? Let's break it up and give them something else to do. And maybe adjusting the difficulty level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I myself, I that's partially where I see game, I, game AI moving is more of... Um, more of a way to like help increase and modify and customize the user experience, not just this, you know, oh, we're just trying to replicate a human being that has intelligence and, and do right. certain actions. And in some way, I guess the, the holy grail of AIs would be um, 
They play the game for you. A game that, like a D and D game, where the AI is the GM, right, yeah. and can yeah. give you the same kind of experiences that, like, I got when I was fourteen years Alexa. old. Alexa, that is interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting take. Thank you. Like, yeah. yep. Alexa, what is it? <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question. Perfect. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the the positive utility you might have kind of finished that thought but like the positive utility of looking at life like a game oh um uh sure um the positive utility uh is that um you can start to break it down right you can start to break it down into the into its game components and figure out like all right what are the resources here what are what are what are goals what are who are the players in this you know there's that there's that famous sort of quote about, you know, if you don't know who the Rube is, it's probably you. But, and, that, and honestly, that's, that's exactly what, what you're doing is when you're trying to figure out who the players are and, and figure out what their goals are. And you see sort of games have all these, these pieces to them that you can, you can break down the, ex the experience of whatever's happening in your life at this moment, whatever challenge you're having and go, all right, well, what, what's the game? What's, what are the game-like components of this? How do they work? How can you, how, like, does that help you manage, did it help you navigate it in some way that you might not be able to see otherwise? Mm. So it's almost like an objective view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's more, a, well, it's a different lens, right? Mm. I don't know that there is a, a completely objective mm. view of anything, but we do talk about lenses. We talk about, in game design, we talk about all these different lenses that you can use. Um, and I tend to think that use, having a variety of lenses is very useful not just in game design, but in everything. Being able to like switch lenses and go, all right, well, what is the, you know, what's the feminist point of view of this, of this particular thing? What's the game design point of view of this sort of thing? What's the, uh, how does this work in terms of bidding? Uh, I heard somebody, this is a slight tangent, but I'm gonna use your, use your uh, uh, question to go off on a tangent. I heard somebody recently say that all games were basically bidding games. <laughs> And I still haven't like worked my way through that thought, but it's a different, it's an interesting lens, right? Uh, so I can actually now, like, now I have this new lens of going, all right, how is this a bidding game? How is this, how is this experience a bid? Like what is, what is being bid? What's, what's the resources being bid? What are the stakes? Uh, does that help? Yeah, awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming, and let's have a big hand for our Master of Game Design, Andy Ashcraft.